When is the last time you listened to a podcast about web development, web design, and small business and didn't fall asleep? Yes, we cover web development, web design, and small business, but like actual human beings with personalities. If you're a beginner, we're not going to talk over your head. It's more like asking your buddy for help. We have guests, we have fun, and let me tell you, these two can get off on a tangent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to HTML All The Things Podcast. This is Matt Lawrence and Mike Curran. That's right, everybody. We are back, and this is the HTML All The Things Podcast. This episode is titled... Our website creation process 2024. So we've discussed this at some point, maybe even a couple of times, but Mike and I run a web dev agency. We help small to medium businesses usually get things done. We also do contracts for larger businesses, of course. And one of the big things that we do is we have to have a process. We have a website creation process. And obviously, you know, we develop the site. You know, that type of stuff is kind of not necessarily set in stone, but obviously it's like you choose the tool, you use that tool, you build the site. Uh, This is very much a technical plus soft skills sort of look at what we do. I know that when we were first starting that we really struggled to find, like, how do you make a website? Like, obviously, HTML, CSS, whatever, you learn that stuff. But then it was sort of like, well, is there wireframes? Are those mandatory? Whatever, right? Like, what's the process? And I'm going to, we're going to get into that in this episode. So if this sounds interesting to you and you want to support the show, you can go and check us out on that Patreon, leave a review or rating on your podcast app, join us in our Discord server, share this with your friends. And remember that we have a Scrimba affiliate link, which may still be a discount code. I will put that in the show notes if I know that it is. Anyway, for sure, it's an affiliate link at the very least. Um, and it will be at scrimba.com slash links slash HTML, all the things. And you can click on that in your uh, show description if your podcast app supports that or you can go and check out the show notes at html all the things.com so i just kind of want to preface this episode more than the little sort of preface that i did by just sort of highlighting some things from the website creation world so people listening to this right now you may be you know in the same place that mike and i were a number of years ago where you might go okay i want to you know make websites for people whether it's full-time or on the side And that's totally a career you could do. That's totally something that you can do freelance or work for other company or what have you. And so you're worried about your procedure. Like, am I building this thing correctly? And I want to say, you know, at the end of the day, everyone's procedure is going to be a little bit different. Uh, I thought that there was supposed to be sort of a set in stone procedure. And I really kind of struggled with that for a couple of years because I was like, man, we're not doing these advanced prototypes. We're not doing these advanced wireframes. What are we doing? And then I heard from, you know, some larger agencies in our community and they, they just said, you know, straight up, we don't let the customer comment on the design. And I assume that means like while it's under construction or even like pre-construction, they don't let the customer kind of get in there and start making complaints. It's only at the certain milestones and maybe I'm even wrong there. The whole point of me saying any of this is that there's a lot of different ways to build websites. There's a lot of different procedures to do so. And websites obviously involve more than just developers. There's design aspects. There's the the development aspect, like I just said. But there's also UI UX experts. If you're um, big enough or if you have a a site that requires it, there's accessibility experts. There might be server admins. Um, Then there's also customers to deal with as well. So their feedback, their questions, their concerns, their upsetness. (laughs) upsetness. <laughs> That's a word. Uh, we get a lot of uh, emails like that sometimes, or it's like, why is this two pixels to the left? It's like, everyone relaxed. The customers can still read the text. It's two pixels to the left. Relax. We will correct that. No worries. So this sort of list of skills that I've said, which is not comprehensive by any means, is a mess, right? It's a mess of skills. It's a mess of demands from clients. It's a mess of timelines. Deadlines that people have if you're subcontracting, like, for example, if you just do the development work and you subcontract out the logo creation, the brand identity, as some places will, then you have to deal with those people as well and their their timelines and those type of things. And if you want to efficiently get through it, this requires that you plan. It requires that you have processes or processes in place. And this is like it's really crucial if you want to be efficient. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about our process, as the name suggests, and our process, again, is 
typically tailored toward people with not a massive budget, and it's usually small to medium business clients. So let's jump right into the process. Just before you jump in, the the other thing I kind of wanted to mention on like the differing ways that the process could go is I think what Matt's going to be outlining, and Matt, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of the happy path and the path that we try to force into each uh, client. The reality is, is that almost every client requires some adjustments to this process because some clients will be more technical, some clients will be less technical, some clients will need a lot of information up front, some clients will need a lot of information at milestone one. Like, like yes, you have to have a rigid process and you have to try to maintain that process, but you also have to be somewhat flexible because no matter what the situation is, you're still dealing with people, people are all different, and if you're too cookie cutter and too rigid, that can turn some people off. And the, the whole thing with client work is you need to get to the end of the project with everyone being happy. You being happy, the client being happy, to the point where they would recommend you to someone else. That That's your goal, right? Like you want them to have the best experience throughout every step and you wanna ha- give them the product that they thought that they, or that they need, even if they didn't know that they needed it. And then at the end of that, you wanna come away with it with like, you know, mutual respect and to the point where they would recommend you. So that should be in a top of mind throughout the process. And whether it's you trying to convince them to stick to the process or you bending a little bit to accommodate them, these are the kinds of conversations and the kinds of mentality you need to have when you're going into a client project. Yeah, like I, th- I think it's it, it's a good thing to mention because one of the things that I'm going to talk about, you know, once I'm done talking about the process is actually checking somebody's seriousness. Like we just discussed, you know, the mess that is, you know, design development, blah, 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 all these different people that you can bring in, all these different expertise you can bring in to build a website. But if the client's just sort of like, it'd be cool to have a site, but like, I don't have a lot of money and like, I don't really want this. It becomes sort of like, okay, I think Mike and I, like you and I have said on the show, like they need it. They don't want it. We have, we have some clients where they certainly are like, we need this, we need this, we need this. Like it's so, it's super important. But then when anything at all ever comes up, they ignore it. Or when you're like, hey, okay, we need you to fill this in. Like you're, you wanted to fill in your own copy. Here's access to the WordPress. They don't fill in their copy. Months go by and then they go like, well, like, why why didn't the site launch? And it's sort of like, well, it's not my fault that you didn't fill in your copy, you know, fill in your copy, <laughs> you know, it's stuff like that. And it's sort of just because like it's not on their mind all the time or even part of the time. It's just not on their mind whenever they say like, oh, shoot, like, I guess I should get get to that website thing. But it's a serious thing. Like it's there's a lot of stuff to be done. Now, there's certainly simpler websites, and I'm going to get into that, and, and I'll jump into our process now. And it usually starts with a phone call. Now, sometimes it's an email or something like that, but usually it's a cold call from a client or a prospective client. And this usually happens, you know, as a complete cold call, like they just sort of found us online, or it's a referral. And that's typically the situation is someone has referred them to us, word of mouth. And in this call, I used to ask a whole bunch of details, and I used to try to get a bunch of stuff, and it's just too much for the first call. So I've tailored this so that I don't really ask for many details. What I attempt to do in this phone call is I get a feel for what they're looking for at a high level. Are they looking for an e-commerce site? Are they looking for a business card site, meaning just a site with very minimal content on it, but it's more or less like a business card? Are they actually looking for a Google My Business plus a business card website. We have a lot of people that will say, I need a website, I need a website, but then they'll be like, hey man, I really need to be on Google Maps because I need people to be able to find me and then press the call button, or I need them to be able to press the message button or the email button, et cetera, right? So this type of thing, it really dictates what they want to do. For example, if I'm talking to somebody and they say, I need an e-commerce website, and then you have a conversation with them and the conversation even at this high level, goes to, well, I make crafts and I make about $300 a month. First thing I'm going to say is, I don't think you should be going with a custom solution because someone's going to have to go in there and maintain things. Someone's going to have to go in there and, you know, fix things up, make sure they're okay, do the updates to say WooCommerce if that's what you're going to use. And I just don't think it's worth it for you. Like it makes more sense for you to go to a place where you sell crafts like an Etsy or a Shopify, and you know, of course, check and make sure that those prospective services rates fit. But this call is a high level call that is about vetting at the end of the day, right? You know, are you 
relying on your website? Are you not relying on your website? If you have an e-commerce or you want e-commerce, is that e-commerce you just selling, you know, $10 worth of stuff, but your business brings in a hundred grand. So you're not really relying on your website. Is your website your actual business? Like, are you looking into getting at full-time blogging and then you need this to be super, you know, secure and everything? Or are you quite literally a person that is doing some sort of hands-on thing where you just want people to call you and the Google My Business card is actually way more important than a website really ever could be because you just don't have the the bandwidth or anything like that to, you know, write blogs and like maintain a full, full-on website. So I avoid the details like crazy in this conversation, like I said, because the details will inevitably take over the conversation. Even when I was like listing out those things to you, like it's like I talked a little more than I thought, right? And that's because details start getting, start getting like into like a web. You start getting caught up in there. Also, like I do these calls this way because it allows me to see if I will potentially work with this person. So for example, if a person is running like a bank web app and they want us to like make a bank web app, this is just beyond the scope of our company. We got two people. You know, we're not available 24-7, 365. We also have other clients. I can't run, you know, a bank app. If you pay me millions and millions and maybe I can hire a team and whatever. But if you're also a person that says, well, I need this bank app by tomorrow. Well, you know, not possible. Sorry, you're going to have to go somewhere else. So this is very much like a vetting call, getting kind of to know each other, getting more importantly to know about each other's project. First of all, I have a question for you. With the initial phone call, do you limit it in terms of not only like scope of what you talk about, but in terms of time? Like, do you try to make it, you know, only 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or do you not care about time in the, at this point? Like, do you just let them kind of babble on? Because I know the reason I'm saying that is a lot of times when you kind of don't put structure around the initial call, and I've had this before early on, they would just start blurting out every part of the business that they want us to touch including like something that could be five years down the line. I remember that being an, a pain point for me, where it's like, I just, how do you stop them <laughs> from getting to that point without being rude and cutting them off? Do you stop them? That's the thing. Like maybe sometimes it's, it's better to just let them keep going so that they have that kind of, they establish that relationship with you right away. I don't know. I will try to structure it generally. I mean, some people just like to talk a whole bunch. And so you kind of can't structure that. And, you know, it, it's a bit of a social thing, right? A bit of a soft skill there where sometimes some people don't fit into the mold of the call. But I mean, most recently I just had a phone call where I said, okay, like I want to get this down to actionables that are, you know, more immediate. And so I want to know what do you need? What are the exact parts of the site you need? What do you think you need? Those type of things. And kind of asked those questions, jotted them down and just, had like a really brief thing. And I, I'd even, you know, kind of tailored it that way. I said, Hey, I'm just letting you know that like, I am just asking at a basic level. I don't need to know like, Hey, in 10 years, if your company becomes like from a one person business to a 30 person business, like that's such a, what if that it's irrelevant right now, right? You're asking for a five page small business website. That's what we're after today. But I mean, also recently we had, I've had several of these almost quote unquote initial phone calls that just led nowhere. And that's almost like a risk of the industry, right? And a part of what you said earlier is like missing the process or the process messing up where the process can't contain everything. It can't contain, you know, the, the template for everybody. And so unfortunately it gets away from you sometimes and people will just keep calling and want to talk a little more, want to talk a little more, want to talk a little more. I do want to point out a real world danger of this, though, of letting somebody talk forever. And this is why you should try to force a little bit of structure to the call. And that is that they'll bring up, you know, a hundred things and it's fresh in their mind. You know, they've been thinking about this potentially for months. And then you don't like you're going to remember what, 10 of the 100 things. And then you won't do something that they asked. And then they'll say like, well, I told you about this already. And then they kind of get, you know, kind of pissed off about it realistically because they're thinking, Hey man, I already told you this is what I wanted. And I'm like, yeah, but I also don't remember 100 things plus multiple projects, plus, 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 like all this other stuff. That's just not how things roll at all, right? Which is like a little unfortunate. That's why I, I force structure on it or try to. Because the next step in the process is a more formal meeting for stuff like this. So I'll usually schedule a formal call. This won't be you know, on a Zoom, or this won't be on a cold call by, by any means. I'll do like a Zoom's call or a, a Teams call. 
usually because I want there to be the option of sharing screen because some people don't sort of share their ideas in a great way or they don't know how to share their ideas when they're talking about a website. And in this meeting, I will prioritize the details. So whereas the initial phone call, I avoided details like the plague, this time I want there to be a lot of details. And this call will be one hour or longer, usually longer. And I'll gather, like I said, all these important details. Okay, yeah, you want this, you want that, you run a golf tournament, you run a fishing tournament also, right? All these little nuanced things. And I also ask questions that would be specific to their experience in particular. So for example, if they need site editing via CMS, right? They don't know what a CMS is, but they, they tell me, I need to be able to edit this site. I need to be able to edit the content. I'll ask them like, well, what do you use? And sometimes I'll get the answer of like, well, nothing. But then as I keep talking to them, they'll mention WordPress. And I'm like, oh, hey, you mentioned WordPress. Like, do you use WordPress? Like, do you know how to use WordPress? And they're like, yeah, that's what I want on my site. See, they don't bring the two together. So this more formal meeting is still structured. And I try to make notes and stuff, or I do make notes as I as we discuss. But it's really important to get into the weeds because it got that little bit of word information about WordPress out. It gets those little bits of information out of people because, again, they're not technical staff usually. So they don't know the importance of telling me, hey, I don't want this CMS. I want this one. Because if I start building in in one technology and then you're like, I don't like that. It's like, well, you're going to have to pay more. <laughs> it's not good for anyone here, right? What I basically am doing at the end of the day in this formal meeting is I'm gathering enough details so that I'm able to generate a formal quote for the client. And that'll be the next step. But basically, it's just a long form document that outlines timelines, scope of work, what I'm doing, the amount of money it's going to cost. And then sometimes it'll also talk about different alternatives for them. And that's something else I want to bring up about in the formal meeting is that the formal meeting is the time in which I try to push bad ideas away. And I know that there's that mentality of like the customer is always right. But things like, hey, I want music blaring, not a good idea. And I'm going to push back on that. Other people will say, hey, I, I want a full ticketing software. And I've had this several times. I want a full ticketing software. I want to be able to process tickets, blah, 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 blah. I sell 100 tickets all year for an event that happens once. It's like, what do you, don't do that. Like, you know, use PayPal, use another payment processor. Like, do not think that a custom solution is the way to do it. I mean, I have to maintain it all year. Every month, go in there, do the updates, do all this and that. For what reason, right? And then you're keeping all this information. Again, like what reason, right? So to me, it just does not make sense. Like a formal meeting or like in the formal meeting, I will always try to push back on some of these bad ideas because... A lot of the time, I can cut things out of the quote right away. Like someone comes in thinking, oh, yeah, like Matt's going to go and install WooCommerce for me. Matt's going to go install like Stripe on WordPress for me or some other e-commerce solution. And I come in and just say, I think that's a bad idea. And I'll explain it. The last client was like, you're right. You know what? That is a bad idea. I think it'd just be better if I invoice people via PayPal. Because they were invoicing 20 people a year. And it's sort of sporadic. It's like you don't need to have an always ready system. You know the people that you're billing. Have them contact you, you send them the invoice, right? Like that's all you need. You don't need some crazy, extravagant, large system that's always ready to go. It's just, they don't need this. Now, if the client's website is very simple, so let's say it's just a Google My Business card in some cases, or it's just a really simple business card website, sometimes right after the initial phone call or in the initial phone call, I will tell them to send me their materials, their logo, the company name, the contact details. And if there's only a small amount of copy, sometimes I'll tell them to send me the copy as well. And then I'll actually skip this formal meeting and I'll go to the next step, which is a formal quote. Because oftentimes I'll mention it to them and say, hey, usually I do a formal meeting with people. I'll just be, be honest. But you know, we're talking about like, you don't care. Like customer doesn't care about the design short of it looking good, working on a phone and it has their colors, company colors, and it also has their logo. 99% of the time when it comes down to that, it's like, okay, hey, formal meeting is useless because this person doesn't care about details to begin with. So why are we discussing details? And so then I'll go on to this next step, which is the formal quote, which I already mentioned a little bit. The formal quote, I'll usually take one to one and a half weeks to generate the formal quote. It doesn't actually take that long to do it, but I'll work on it here, there, send it to Mike, him and I'll have like a bit of a conversation of like, that's a little too much. That's not enough, whatever, et cetera. 
And this quote is pretty detailed. So it will include a detailed work breakdown. It will have a timeline with variable parts. So for example, I'll say, okay, five weeks in, I will send you the product as it is. I'll hit a milestone and I'll send you the product as it is at that milestone. And if you don't answer, then this project might get pushed back. And if you don't answer for weeks or months or like a year, which we have had, you don't answer for a very long time, like your project gets put back into the queue. Like I'm not going to wait and like keep my schedule clear. So like, you know, please answer within a week or please answer within five days or whatever it is. I'll also mention things like, hey, delays may happen due to holidays, you know, Canada Day or whatever, vacations, those type of things. You don't want them to think that you're clearing your schedule for them, unless you are, of course, right? So I disclose everything right here, and I just say, like, this is what's happening, this is how I work, I'm going to work on your project for a couple days a week, I'm going to work on your project for the whole week, whatever it is. Just disclose everything so they're not surprised. And make it clear that there can be delays that are out of your control. The client not answering, I've already mentioned that one, but it could be other things like, let's say the client is trying to get you something, like they themselves are working with a graphic design agency, and they're supposed to give you a bunch of stuff in a week, and they take nine weeks to give it to you. It's like, well, your project has to be delayed now, right? So this stuff I put in the timeline as my sort of variable parts, and I make it clear. I also make a very clear payment structure and a payment schedule as well, actually, with that in mind. And Mike and I used to never do this, and this is like a really crucial thing. Depending on the size of the project, we'll do an upfront payment. So we'll do like half upfront or something like that. And then maybe a schedule of payments afterwards. Maybe it's based on milestone, those type of things. It really depends on the project and what you're comfortable with. Here's the thing with the payment structure is that you have to be comfortable or mostly comfortable because, I mean, this always sucks. You have to be mostly comfortable with them ghosting you. At any time, like you could finish a whole $10,000 project. That's great. You're like, man, I'm going to get that 10 k This is awesome. I'm going to be able to pay my bills. And then they just don't answer you. And that's over. Like, And they might not answer you for like two years. Mike and I have had this where people answer you a year or two later and just think the project is like on, you know, can be continued. And it's sort of like, well, like our pricing's changed. It's a big mess, right? So having a structure and a pretty strict structure, I would say, around payment is really important. Such as, here's the timeline. It's going to take six weeks to do this project. I require 50% upfront, or I will not begin the six-week period. And if you delay payment by more than the net 30, then unfortunately, the six weeks may be impacted. It might go to nine weeks. A lot of the time, people will say, that's so stupid. You know, you're trying to get out of work. You know, you're being lazy. Not the case. Like, I can't wait to see if you're going to be dedicated to this project. And if someone else calls me tomorrow and starts the process, they, they have that cold call with me. They might pay me more money, you know? I need to be paid. If you're just a, what do they call them, a looky-loo or whatever, if you're just a person that's like window shopping, you know, been dedicated enough to window shopping, I guess, to get to this stage, like I need to be paid in order to start work because then we're going to get really into the weeds and we're going to actually, you know, engage people and start doing some development work. I think another important thing to consider with the formal quotes and something that I think we struggled with early on is that people don't read. Nothing against people and, and all that, like nothing against the general public. You know, it's just the reality of the situation. No matter how detailed you make these quotes, no matter what you do, you can almost guarantee that probably most of it, if even if it is read, won't be retained. So just having it there is good for yourself to like refer back to and stuff like that. But you're going to have to continually remind the client about everything payment structure, timelines, they'll forget. They'll either won't read or forget or whatever. So if milestones are super important to you, expect to have to send reminders about the milestones that are coming up. I think that's something that we struggle with, that we've struggled with before. And it's just the human nature aspect of it. I don't know. It, it's just really hard to maintain a communicative relationship with a client over an extended period of time when the client's primary business isn't your thing that you're working on. They're working in chaos, most likely, just like you are. And them touch, having a touch point with you, you know, once a month or something like that, it just it sometimes isn't a priority for them. Not everyone. Sometimes the clients are really invested in the project, but sometimes they're not. And it's up, kind of up to you as the person that's creating the project to force it to be a priority. 
Now, Matt and I have gone through this where like you, you send out reminder emails, you try to call them sometimes and they just ghost you. That's on them. Like if they ghost you, they ghost you. There's no amount of reminders that you can send out to prevent a ghost. But there is that little bit of push that you can do before each milestone, before each payment comes out that can help them be aware that the project is continually going forward. So just something to keep in mind. Don't expect them to retain the information that you tell them in this formal quote. They might read it over and might like, you know, approve it or whatever, but that does not mean that they know what you're talking about. That's a very good point. Like even Mike and I were just talking about how like we have someone else edit this show now and we've been like starting to like outsource some stuff just because we're so kind of spread thin and I can't always get back to the people, right? Like even though I'm, you know, working with people, I can't get back to everybody like right away as quickly as I'd like personally and professionally and it just you know it sucks but they're gonna do the same thing to you right you may clear your schedule for six weeks or whatever to do their project but they're not going to remember everything and so continual reminders or you know please refer to the document please refer to page two whatever those type of messages as non passive aggressively as possible hopefully <laughs> as you can, you know, sort of thing to say like, Oh, this is covered in step two. Like just like review it again or whatever. But a absolutely. Like it's a really good point because they're not going to remember as much as like, you don't remember like when your Netflix renews, like who remembers that type of stuff, right? Like you offload things in life and then they get off, they're offloaded. You don't think about them anymore. So this is where the next step in the process here and sort of the final step, because I'm not getting into like the technicals of like, I'm using react and I'm using this and I'm using that. You know, this is the end of the process where we work begins, there's milestones, there's deployment. So this is kind of a bit of a meat and potato situation though, is because this is where I really struggled again with when we first got started and it was okay. The money has been dealt with, you know, the client's happy with it. They've greenlit it. Maybe they've paid the amount up front that you're happy with, et cetera. It's time to begin work. And it's sort of like, okay, well, what's my procedure? What about wireframing? What about prototyping? What about designs? If you don't know, wireframing is just sort of quickly sketching either with a program or on paper, rough layouts of like, okay, you know, if there's an image, you just draw like a square with an X and you sort of draw a gobbledygook for the headings and stuff, or maybe you just write heading and things. You're just getting a rough feel for what the page is going to roughly look like. It's not colored. It's not you know, interactive in any way or anything like that. You leave that for the design phasing and the prototyping. So, I mean, designs, obviously you're starting to actually put real images in there or at the very least stock photos in there. You're starting to put color to stuff and it, you know, it should roughly reflect what the wireframe looks like. And then prototyping typically taken from the designs, usually done in the same program in many cases, is you provide the client with an interactive version of the website or the web app that is interactive to an extent, right? Where they can click around the nav bar and it takes them to different pages and stuff. Now, I want to say that that's a lot of work, right? We haven't even begun the actual work on the real thing. And these steps, wireframing, prototyping designs, I think are optional. And they come into effect depending on the complexity of the project, the size of the business, those type of things. For Mike and I, you know, dealing with small to medium business clients more often than not, Typically, development speed and lower budgets are more important than them knowing exactly what the end product is going to look like. Because wireframing, prototyping, and designs give you like a certain level of certainty of like, okay, that's what it's going to look like. Whereas many of these people are like, I don't care if that button is 200 pixels or 100 pixels wide, as long as people can click it and it works, I need to get going here, right? Like they got to get going and like, fair enough. So you know, kind of save the wireframing, prototyping, and designs. And I actually should be saying wireframing, designing, and prototyping, because usually prototyping is after you design it. But, you know, save that type of stuff for bigger sites. You, usually, at least this is my recommendation, is you, you know, save that for bigger sites that need to be super specifically designed. Another thing, though, even if it is a, is a small business, is I would actually use wireframing, prototyping, and designs, and not necessarily all three of them, but I would use these if there's a lot of stakeholders and all those stakeholders have a say. If each one of those stakeholders has a veto power, I start showing some designs. I start showing some wireframing, or I start showing more things in progress, not necessarily at milestones. I'll be like, I finished the slider. Please take a look. 
this is cumbersome and I don't like doing this. I think in other episodes I've said, like, don't do this because it does slow you down. But in the particular case of you have a lot of stakeholders that have a veto, you do not want to have like, you know, a huge page done and it's like 99% done. But that 1% of the time takes like quadruple the time it took to complete the 99% because people are fighting over whether there should be an arrow or a chevron as the icon for a slider. And that can absolutely happen with stakeholders, especially a lot of them. We've had it. We've had it done. It's cost us hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in, in, in billable hours. It's a nightmare. So sometimes you do need to bring in that level of certainty with the wire wireframing designing and the prototyping. But nine out of 10 times, Mike and I skip those three entirely. They're gone. We don't, we don't really touch them. If I'm really struggling with an idea, I'll maybe do some wireframing just for me, not for the client at all. Uh, and oftentimes clients don't usually see wireframes. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Again, there's that little bit of wishy-washiness. Like you make your own process and, you know, make your own judgment calls. The real meat and potatoes here at the end of the day, I guess, is that, you know, you're starting to develop it. And once you developed it, you deploy it. So what I like to do is I like to develop things in a development environment. A lot of the people that we work for, they already have a website and I don't like to build on their server. Many times they'll be like, oh, I'll just spin up a subdomain. No, because if I got to mess with any of the PHP settings and stuff like that, I don't need to be dealing with an IT incident at the same time as also doing development work. I'd rather do it on my server that if there's an IT incident, it's a development server. Literally, it's not an incident. It's like, oh no, my server's down. If my server was down for two months, it's like, oh no. Like it's not a big problem, right? The, the biggest problem is that I can't work. So I'm just going to go in and fix it. I don't need the angry phone call of like, why is my website down, right? So I'll work in this development environment, which is completely isolated from the production environment, if it exists already. And I'll finish the majority of the site. I'll get it to, you know, one of those milestones that was pre-negotiated. And then I'll show it off to the client. Once they give me approval for the first pass, maybe I'll bill them if that's been agreed upon. And everything's been paid. Everything's good. Then I'll get going and I'll start making changes based on their feedback. So they'll change, give me a bunch of changes, basically, right? Like the green light, what I've done so far. Give me a bunch of changes, to be clear. Then I'll go and make those changes. When people give you changes, like don't freak out. You're like, oh my God, I did it wrong. It's not wrong. There's a million and one things, right? There's margins, there's padding, there's, you know, this goes that way and this and that. You can't show the client what the website's going to look like in every single screen orientation, blah, 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 blah. Like to you, stacking it vertically looks good and you can read it and no, none of the text is being overlapped. So, you know, two thumbs up. <laughs> but that's not the case necessarily. It's not, like they may get super pissed off about something. Like they might go, hey, that, you know, that shouldn't be stacked vertically. That should be horizontal. We should be squeezing it. And they might get like super upset about that if, if it were to reach production. This is the point in which, you know, you make those conversations, you have those conversations, you take the customer feedback, and again, it's not your fault if they have it, because they always will. There's too many moving parts. Then you go, you implement those changes based upon their feedback, and then you get final approval. So you, you show them again. Maybe you even have to build them again, again, depending on how your payment structure is. You show them it, and you say, okay, this is my second pass. Are we good? Sometimes there's some last minute feedback and you have to do those. But in general, you know, in a perfect world, I guess, you're done at this point, right? They say, yep, green light. Now you do, you know, your deployment. Now, again, in our case, for whatever reason, nine out of 10 times we do it on their existing hosting. We take it, we throw it on there. We're also partnered with a local shop. They do the hosting. So we just, you know, we're used to their hosting. We know how to log in and all that. We just go in and set the hosting up the way we need to because there's a variety of settings, of course, and then we just do it. Or we'll even put it on our own hosting if we need or want to because we have some reseller hosting. And then we collect our final payment and that's it. Now, for our clients commonly, not everybody, but specifically small to medium business clients, you know, there's going to be things that come up, right? Like they didn't notice that something was red, they wanted it blue. I'll do little things like that here and there. Usually it's like for a month or two, I'll do it, you know, whatever. But there comes a point when I'm like, hey, you got to pay. And I mean, Mike, you and I have had this conversation where we've had sites up for seven years. They go down because they've been hacked or they just go down because they've been messed up or, you know, God knows what, right? And, you know, we haven't been involved. Like we were hired to build it, deploy it. They said, thanks. They paid us and we left. Like that's what they wanted. They didn't want any maintenance. They didn't want any help. Okay. Then they call us and they go like, yeah, but you built this. So you got to like fix it up. And it, it just makes no sense. I think Mike, you had a, a story you read on Reddit one time where like someone called their plumber after they had like their shower had broken after 14 years or something obscene. And it was like, yeah, but like you're responsible for the shower. It's like, I have a lifetime 
obligation, I guess, to this shower head. Like, I need to fix that for free for the rest of our lives. If the house burns down, that shower head better be mint condition in the ruins because I am responsible. Like, that's ridiculous. Like, no. So I just start telling people, like, you got, hey, man, like, do you want me to prepare a quote? Nine out of ten times, they don't get back to you. Usually they're pissed, but oh well. <laughs> like, I don't mean to sound like a jerk, but at that point, it's like, it was seven, eight, nine, ten years ago I built this for you. You paid me, you know, a thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, seven hundred dollars, whatever it was. I can't help you again. Like, I can't, I'm not going to do hundreds of hours or whatever. Little things, maybe. Like, oh, no, the Twitter lo logo stopped working. I'll just go in there and change the AHREF a bit. Maybe I'll do that if I'm feeling nice. But, you know, you're not obligated unless it was in the agreement. You're not obligated to do that. So you do have to look out for that. I think that's a bigger problem than people realize is that it's not from like a nefarious perspective a lot of times. It's just kind of like inherently ingrained in people that like, hey, even if they're not paying a maintenance fee, even if they're not paying any, like they, they literally had a one-time payment and it says clearly in the contract that any extra work is extra work, extra money. They think that because it's something that was built outside of their knowledge scope, that they have no choice but to reach out to you and ask you that, right? Without acknowledging the fact that they they should be paying. Now, some people, to be fair, some people do reach out, say, hey, like, you know, after three or four years, hey, I've updated my contact details. Can you please update them? I'm willing to pay. I think we've had that a couple times. And usually, again, if it's something like literally changing out some text or some an AHREF, and they've acknowledged that, hey, like they would pay for it, you can be pretty generous in that scenario and be like, okay, it's going to take me like 10 minutes. I'm not going to charge you because like they've offered to pay. They're obviously doing it from the perspective of like, Hey, I just need this done. And they understand the value of your time. It, it's the thing where like they don't value your time and they don't value your expertise. That's what rubs me the wrong way. A lot of times that's when all I might be a little bit more petty at like, like Matt was saying. And that again, both scenarios happen scope creep in general, like scope creep, even during the process of development, like let's say you get to milestone one and this has happened to us where like, they're just like, Oh, I, how are we going to edit this? And we're like in the formal quote. And we had like a whole meeting about this, that you're not going to edit it. Like you're just going to send us the updates once a year and we'll edit it for you. They're like, no, no, no. Like we're obviously going to edit these pages. And at that point you're just like, well, we literally had, like, we've had the discussion with them. We're just like, Hey, if we build it in this way, you're not going to be able to edit it yourselves. Like we've had it in an email, we've had it in a call. And at that point you're just like, well, I'm sorry. Like we're building it this way. We can pivot now, not an issue, right? Like we'd have to maybe push some timelines down the road for other clients, but that's going to also cause a renegotiation of quote, because this is like double the work. And you explain it to them as best as you possibly can in the nicest way you can. And sometimes they'll be like, well, yeah, okay, let's do it. Like, let's renegotiate. Let's do it because, like, we, did, we misunderstood. Like, I see that you did send us all that information and we just misunderstood. And that's fine. Sometimes they'll be pissed because of a misunderstanding. And as you progress in your career as a freelancer or even just a regular developer during, like, meetings and stuff like that, you'll be able to suss out and get better requirements from less information. And what I mean by that is like when someone gives you a direction to go or like that idea that they have that you want to build, you'll ask the right questions to get the correct set of work breakdowns and, and requirements. Earlier on, it's almost impossible to get that right because you just don't know what questions to ask. You don't know like how to ask that question correctly that they want the, their pages, including their blog page, like this, this is what we missed, to be editable, right? Like the blog page makes sense. Like it makes sense to be editable. And from a logical perspective, they've worked with blogs all their lives that like they were always the ones that wrote them. So they didn't even think to ask that. They thought that inherently that was what we built. But even though we mentioned that none of it would be editable, they didn't understand that. So... It's those little things that you have to kind of hammer down in the early stages. And sometimes if the project is big enough, I've heard this happening, after the formal quote is done and before work begins, you can have another step. Yeah, wireframing, prototyping, all that is important, but you can have another step even before that where you have like a four or five hour long meeting. This is a little bit gratuitous, but if the project is complex enough and important enough and the, the time and the the amount that's being paid and like the timelines are tight enough, you might need to just 
schedule a full afternoon with the client and go through every possible scenario. Go through everything you can before generating that list of requirements. Ask them every question you could possibly think of. And you have to tell them this up front that this is going to be a tedious process. You're going to be exhausted at the end of it, but we need this to get it right. If you're going to be spending fifty dollars to $100,000 on this project, which some people do, this is the step you need to take to make sure that you're investing your money correctly, that you need to spend this four or five hours. And again, this is not something we've done particularly. Like Matt and I haven't worked on projects of that size but it's something that I've talked to other uh, large agencies about because we were thinking about going down that route. And they like broke this down for me perfectly. They're just like, yeah, sometimes clients won't want to participate in that meeting. They're, willing, they're still willing to pay. And sometimes we turn that down. We'll turn down a $50,000 project because we know that if a client's not invested in getting it right at that stage, regardless of that $50,000, we're probably not going to get that money at the end because... We're not going to be able to get it right for them. They're going to, you know, ghost us at the like, halfway point or something like that because we didn't get it right. They weren't willing to invest the time to get it right. There's no point in working with them. And I understand that from a lot of perspectives because it, it's all about how you, the, the give and take between you and a client. Like to get something done correctly, you both need to be invested in it, especially at a large scale. Like small websites, it's different, but like at a large scale, you need to be invested in it and you need to be okay with taking like the client needs to be okay with taking extra time here and there and you need to be in it to be be successful you have to own the project you know you raise a really good point and also a memory in my mind that is like really fresh now actually i don't know if you remember this mike but we discovered and like you kind of knew they existed but we kind of discovered that there's some agencies out there that just cookie cutter everything they basically spin up a basic CMS. That CMS has some sort of basic layout, whether it's a theme or whatever. And I'm not talking WordPress. Like, obviously, WordPress has a lot of themes, a lot of different things you could do to its appearance. I'm talking like some random, and I mean random, piece of technology that they use. And how do we describe this? They, like, basically take the basic cookie cutter. They take the person's pictures, maybe the logo, and they throw it in. And they have, like, 150 sites that they have that they maintain. And all 150 sites look exactly the same, right? That's totally fine and whatever. Like, I'm not stepping on toes. Like, if that's what the person wants, it's a basic, you know, basic way to put it up, whatever, yada, yada. But I don't know if you remember this, Mike. We've had conversations with people where we get right around that stage of that big meeting. Now, we haven't, you know, like you said, we haven't really done that big meeting. We have done, you know, I guess semi-big meetings with people. But we've had people request things from us that are just totally, totally out to lunch. I don't know if you remember this, Mike, but we had a request where the website needed to route people based on their location, but no right turns or no left turns or something like that. Like it was super specific. It was like really specific shite, like just really, really like, holy crap, this is going to be a lot of work. So we bring it up to them and say, hey, you're like a local little thing. That's going to be like thirty thousand dollars because we got to hire someone that does google maps we also have to have all this other seo stuff you don't know how to do social media you know what i mean and we're talking about this is a one-person business and they don't understand the scope of what they're asking so then what happens is in the same vein that you were talking about mike they don't want to have that detailed meeting with you they're like that's ridiculous i'm not paying 30k and i say hey man i think we should just talk about scope we got to freaking scope this down i think you actually want this they ignore that meeting or we refuse the client either way, right? They ghost us. We just tell them, hey, sorry, this is not going to work out. They then go to one of those cookie cutter places and use that website successfully. And usually the design is horrible. Not always. But sometimes usually the design is just horrible. Buttons don't work properly and stuff. And they use that website for, for five years, 10 years successfully. No problem. And it was like a third or less of the complexity of what they told us. And if they had just talked to us, and wanting to put that extra, you know, two hours in of like, hey, we got to nail this down. Like you're asking for some serious, serious coding work, like avoiding all left turns. Like what happens if you can't like this is chaos. Like, you know what I mean? Like what if you can't turn that way because of the law and like, you know, absolute lunacy or you're in the country. So you got to go around about 40 acres with the farms and do like a loop and like, you know, chaos. And you try to bring that up to them. And they're like, you're you know, you don't know what you're doing, blah, 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 whatever. And then they just go with these cookie cutter people. And the thing I wanted, the thing I wanted to mention is we dodged a bullet there. Those people grabbed a client, 
presumably they're happy with their website, I hope. And we dodged a bullet there because I'll tell you right now, I'm not doing all that for friggin' a dollar a day. Because that's what it'll equate to. They'll bug you so much, it'll be a dollar a day. And that's why those big agencies, even though it's 50K, they're like, I'm not taking $100 a day. Like, think about the amount of money $100 is. Like, it's nothing. Like, the government comes, takes a piece, you split it up among all the partners, you do. You know, it gets crushed on, crushed on, crushed on, and then you end up with, like, this piece of lint that's on my sock. Like, it's, you know what I mean? Like, like it's just like, sorry, man. Like, I'm not taking a piece of lint per day at the end of the day. Like, it's just not going to work. And so... That's a very critical thing you brought up is like sometimes you go through even, you know, three out of four steps of the procedure, however long your procedure is, and it just doesn't work out. And that's fine. And I have two side notes I want to touch on. One's not in the show notes. I'm just going to touch it very brief because I wanted to mention it. But this one is in the show notes right now. And it's check seriousness. This is, is something that we, you know, we've touched on throughout the episode. Mike touched on it as well, etc. Just want to kind of solidify it and kind of just say it out in the open. This process that Mike and I have come up with, the one that I've just outlined for you, even if it's truncated, like let's say there's no designs, there's no wireframes, there's, there is no prototyping. This may seem drawn out, right? You're like, man, you know, you're making people jump through hoops and everything else. You know what? Yeah, I am. The reason why is because many customers are more excited about the prospect of having a website or a web app. But when the process starts and money starts having to flow, they start, uh, you know, they don't answer for a week. Yeah, uh, they're not too serious. Uh, they're not actually happy with the price, even though they said they were. They never gave you the images. And then they ghost you and it's over. Because they don't want it and they didn't realize the scope of it. And they're not excited about it because the development part typically isn't as exciting. And so this is an example of checking seriousness. How serious is that prospective client about their project? So for example, I will commonly ask a customer to send over their details in an email. And it is extremely common that they won't do it. I'll say, hey, send me your logo, your company name, and a little bit of your copy. Or like, send me the photos you want in your gallery. I know that this is going to require them to sit at a computer, write my email, write the subject, write this down. It's going to take 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes if they have the stuff ready. And they're not going to do it. So how serious were they? They weren't. Now, maybe they were too busy. You know, I'm not, not trying to judge. But if they're too busy or not serious enough to deal with the project that we're building, which is, you know, complex, all the parts that I mentioned in the beginning of the episode, then we've dodged a bullet. And honestly, so have they, because they might just go to like a service like wordpress.com, throw together or something with a theme where they just do it on their own time. And that's it. Perfect. And that's great. I want to mention something else really quick as well. And I think Mike, you might have something to add to this. And that is that on the formal quote, like, Mike, when you mentioned specifically the, like, hey, we asked you if you wanted editing, you said no. So in the quote, we said no editing. Sometimes we will offer a path in the quote. So we'll say, like, this is the cheaper way. This is the more expensive way. And the reason why we do that is because sometimes a client will be, like, super into something that's a bad idea. And I mentioned earlier, like, in the calls and that, that I will try to tell them and try to cut off any bad ideas. Like, the music's a bad idea. This is a bad idea. Whatever. A lot of the time, the bad idea is because of money. So in the formal quote, I'll offer a path. And I'll say, if you go down this path that you want me to, it's $5,000. You go down this other path, it's $200. What do you want to do? So now that they see the money and they have a big old document in front of them, hopefully they read it, they'll choose one or the other. Now, I will do that sometimes. However, it can add nuance to Mike's situation where sometimes they'll read the cheaper option, choose the cheaper option, which is to not have an editor and then be like, yeah, but having an editor is in the quote. No, it wasn't. It was option A or option B. It chose option A, no editor. I'm not getting option A and B. Like, that's not how that works. So it can add a bit of nuance, especially when people don't read and they just skim. But sometimes, and it's up to your discretion, sometimes giving or offering people options within the quote is actually a great idea. I'll caveat this a little bit. I, I agree with it, but only in a very narrow use case. The only time I would give options is when they're very pushy on doing the really expensive thing when you know that that thing shouldn't be done. And then you give them that price difference to kind of almost push them in the cheaper direction. And this is like a client relation thing. This is a you maybe not having the expertise to do the crazy expensive thing. Maybe you just don't want to spend an extra month doing this project, even for a ridiculous amount of, even for a good amount of money. I don't know. 
I think the only time you want to offer them that choice is when you're trying to push them down in price, if that makes sense. In my view, as the professional, you almost always want to offer them a happy path, the one path that should have their needs met, that solves your needs for have, for generating income and solves their needs for whatever project you're building for them or website you're building for them. Because your view as a professional is that this is the path that you should take. Giving them options most of the time will cause confusion rather than give solutions. Now, again, I, like I said, the caveat here is that sometimes having that price view that they see is a deciding factor for them. And if your intention is to decide for them to go lower or something like that, then it could really help in that situation. Or again, price them to a point where it does make sense. Like you price it so high that it makes sense for you to do it, right? Like that that's another option like that, that you can give yourself. But again, personally, I like, I prefer the, hey, here's the happy path. You don't need to choose anything. Just choose this path. If you don't like it, it's okay. We can go like, you know, go our separate ways amicably. Let us know if you have any questions, et cetera, et cetera. Because my problem with giving a lower cost option is like most of the time people will choose that. And most of the time the experience is worse. That's just how it is for me, at least. I a thousand percent agree with you. Like, it's very good that you mentioned this is like that option tree is very specific. Like you said, it's very much for sorry, but this person's being foolish. <laughs> Don't tell them that this person's being foolish where they're like, I have a hundred dollar a month budget, but I want the thousand dollar a month options. Like that's literally not right. Like you can't afford it. <laughs> you know, if they're just being totally ridiculous and just think that either you're going to eat the cost or whatever, then no, that's just not going to happen. So yeah, use that with, you know, a massive grain of salt, like the, the options, only give it when you really think of it. And it brings up a very good point of this stuff, like this procedure Mike and I have come up with is not perfect. Everyone's is a little bit different. You may agree with some, you may disagree with some, you may disagree with all of it, you may agree with all of it. If you go through and you copy us, you choose, our, you do the same procedure as us that we just laid out, you may find that Matt and Mike were wrong about part one. Matt and Mike were wrong about this meeting, whatever. Your customers are going to be in a different area. They maybe have a different size. The people that you attract, because maybe you worked on one project and the word of mouth got into a certain community. So the people you attract may be more demanding. They may be less demanding. You might make more money making rapid fire small websites with less of a procedure. That might happen to you. So like, just remember, it's like your business, like you're freelancing and to tailor this experience to what you're experiencing. But this is a like seven plus year. This is how we get through things. And I'll tell you right now. Already this week, and I'm going to say like one and a half because one's kind of wishy-washy. One and a half people have already refused. I gave them a small task. You don't do it. I'm not going to call you. I don't care. That sounds really harsh, but I'm not going to chase you every time I need something. It's like I'm busy, too bad. <laughs> you know? But if I wasn't busy, tailor my experience. Maybe I would call you a few times. Just something to consider. Run your business as you see fit, as you need to. Hopefully this episode has helped you in any possible capacity, especially if you were stuck on the semantics of like, oh my God, am I designing, you know, websites, right? Do I have to have wireframes? You know, like who's checking? <laughs> you know? Don't worry about that kind of thing. So if you want to support episodes like this, Mike, do you have anything else to add? I should have asked. No, no, all good. Wrap up that conclusion. Excellent. So if you want to support this show, you can do so via Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. And many thanks to our $3 tier patrons. Tim from the Web Hacker on the webhacker.com, Jason from Geek Life Radio via geekliferadio.com, Garrett Segal, Level Up Financial Planning via www.levelupfinancialplanning.com, Joshua via silvio.us, and Magnus from YesWeb via yesweb.se. Remember, we also have a Shrimba affiliate link. It may be a discount code. We're going to work on getting that to be more coherent on my side. So anyway, that'll be on the show description. And also in the show notes, and we'll have like whether it's a discount code or not in there, hopefully. Go check that out. That helps support us and it supports Scrimba, a great service where they have an interactive media player code editor and you can learn how to code on there. And they recently, I don't know when this episode's coming up, but they recently or will soon have like a version two of the site, which looks pretty cool. We got to check out a little bit of it. So that, that's been pretty neat. And we'd also like to give a shout out to Michael Laraka, a contributing author on HTML allthethings.com. Michael is the author of Self-Taught, the X Generation blog at selftaughttxg.com. 
feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on. And this outro will sign us off. You've been listening to HTML All The Things Podcast. Web development, web design, and small business. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show. And we hope you appreciate that we talk to you like human beings. And we hope you had some fun. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media. On Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at HTML All The Things. And on Twitter at HTML Everything. Until next time, this is HTML All The Things. Signing off.